I understand why why people would have their own individual opinions about abortion, but I don't understand why the necessity of forcing that on the rest of the country and forcing somebody that you don't even know to go through childbirth. Like I, I, I so help me just understand that. Yeah, it really depends on what um, your understanding is of what's happening inside the womb during pregnancy. Um, is that a human life or is it not? If it's not a human life, if it's a, um, you know, if it's the equivalent of your appendix, uh, you know, a, t- a teeth that a tooth that needs pulling, um, then there's there's no reason for us to be doing what what it is that we're doing, right? But this is a second human being with um, with a rights we believe that deserves equal protection under the law. This is a human rights battle. And uh, that is why, that is what has driven um, this movement since Roe versus Wade to seek protection for the most vulnerable. They have no other voice but ours. Um, They're unseen, unheard, but they're an entire constituency, 50 million lives lost since Roe versus Wade. So if you believe as I do, and as science teaches us that there is a unique human being from the moment of conception, um, then you want to fight for those lives. Poland, for viewers, uh, re- you know, over the last several years, restricted abortion rights quite significantly. Since then, you know, two, there have been massive protests because two women di- with ectopic pregnancies died because the hospitals believed that the, the law barred them uh, from performing abortions, even though the fetuses had died within their wombs. That, the government later said, no, 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 in this case, it would have been okay. But when you set up a situation where a procedure is criminalized, we know how institutions operate. We know how people operate. They're going to say, oh, well, this this might be criminal, so I'm just going to hope for the best for this woman. And both of these young women uh, in their 20s, I believe, that both of them died. Uh, and so now they're re-looking at this. Do you, do, you, do you believe that this is a kind of final victory that you guys have won? Or are you going to push it is the movement going to push it further or do you think that it's going to kill women as, as people in hosp- doctors and hospitals you know decline to perform abortions of ectopic pregnancies you know a fetus that dies in the tube uh, and the result of people dying is going to then create a backlash what, what what's your read on on how the Poland situation compares to here yeah, I'm. We're very concerned as a movement about the well-being of women and children, um, and the situations that you mentioned are tragic. I think we need to look to the states um, that have started to um, enact, even before this decision, strong pro-life protections. There are always exceptions for um, si- situations where the the life and health of the mother are at risk. With in the cases of these ectopic pregnancies, um, going in and removing that unborn child is not an abortion. Um, that is saving the life of the mother um, when the, this is this is not the life the life of the child is lost at that point because. Um, because of the circumstances of where the the baby has implanted, and I am I'm very concerned uh, as as we sort of observe this uh, unfold here in the United States about the increase in chemical abortion, and the fact that there may be women with ectopic pregnancies who are being given chemical abortion drugs, which will not resolve an ectopic pregnancy, um, and then then going into emergency rooms without knowing. Um, without the doctors knowing exactly what's going on. There's a very um, disturbing expansion of chemical abortion drugs that's happening right now across America. Um, I absolutely do not support, um, you know, doctors denying health care to women uh, when um, the, in circumstances like there there were in Poland. It has it has been kind of the, the it, a major point of contention for reproductive health rights and justice advocates and for providers of abortions, that Roe v. Wade has really been the the floor, right, of the the bare minimum of what's needed, the legal right. But people, millions of people have not had the access they need for a long time. And this sort of this the culmination of really 30 years of investment in state legislatures and packing the courts sort of got us to this moment. This did not just emerge all of a sudden. This shouldn't shock anyone. Um, they've been telling us they're planning to do this for a long time. 
And so it is welcome, right, on the part, certainly on the part of senators, it would be welcome were it to come from the president to recognize this moment for what it is, a stage five fire at this stage. But don't come at it at this point with a small bucket. You haven't been doing what you need to do uh, to preserve rights and to expand access. But now that we're here, we need you to really step up and lean into this moment, recognize it for what it is and do what we need, do everything you can possible to both stop right, what's happening in the courts but and, and, and do what you need to do in the states to make sure that people can get the health care they need. And I was at the Supreme Court the other night. It did seem like there was increasing comfort with saying, this is a woman's right. Um, you may think it is a life, um, but it is a woman's right even so. Um, how have you seen that sort of shift? And, and where do you come down on that question of, you know, what President Biden, when President Biden referred to a child? I think it's a strange thing to do to refer to a fetus as a child. Um, I and I think it, you know, it's the the question of whether we should, um, what you know, how we should think about or talk about um, what is true about, you know, what's happening inside a woman's body when she's pregnant and the state of a fetus. I, it feels like a total distraction to me because the bottom line is that there. The decision and the need to have an abortion varies. I mean, the, the, the reasons are can be very extremely complicated. They can come at very different stages. And there's just no reason for the government to play or any sort of role in figuring out where a line is, when it's acceptable to 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 determine when and if a woman can have abortion. This is health care. This is a conversation that should be happening between the pregnant person and their doctor. The, uh, the woman. And, Say, I'm sorry. I said, I said the woman and her doctor. Okay, there, as we know, there are people who can be pregnant who do not identify as women. So, but no, I wouldn't just limit it to women. I would say anybody who can become pregnant should be able to make that decision between with their doctor. There's just no point at which we need to have uh, government intervention. And it just, and, and, and frankly, it just, it ties the hands of people who are trying to serve both, right? They People people want uh, everybody involved in here to be healthy and to have healthy, you know, and to have healthy lives and be able to survive something like this. It's just unacceptable that we would want to put restrictions in place that could possibly lead to a pregnant person dying. The argument that the public health authorities are making is that at, at the time, well, A, they have more data, they're saying, uh, but at the time, uh, there, the risk of getting COVID uh, outweighed the risk of getting the vaccine and there wasn't enough vaccine around. Now there's enough of the other vaccines so that they can now, uh, you know, t take a more cautious approach to J and J. I think the problem with that is that the people who were most susceptible to these blood clots, in my understanding are women in their kind of twenties, thirties and forties, uh, are, are not the most susceptible to, you know, hospitalization and death from COVID. And so if they knew ahead of time, you know, they, what they could have said is that if you're a woman in your 20s, 30s, 40s, don't take right. don't take J and J. Whereas whereas they, they were messaging that that those were the people who were more at risk, but they didn't kind of come out with a hard you know sell to say, you know, don't don't move forward with this vaccine. And, and you know, after the pause, they came back and said, OK, uh, you know, this is this is safe, safe and effective was the word that you know the, you, you would hear on the radio or you would hear from the FDA. Right. And that's what's so frustrating about this is, you know, average citizens are not scientists and cannot be expected to be medical experts or scientific experts and evaluate the uh, the efficacy of every vaccine. We outsource that work to other people. We can put in as much work as possible to make sure that we're safe, our families are safe. But ultimately, the interpretation of the science, uh, we do outsource to people. We need to have that trust. Um, and so I think, Ryan, everything you just outlined makes complete sense sense. Um, and yet it's still so frustrating that the safe and effective line w was trotted out. And here we are like two years later. I mean, I I'm vaccinated. I hope my friends and family are vaccinated. Um, but it, it's I feel like this is just a devastating blow to public trust that has been that has been devastating over and over again for the last two years. Um, I, I, it's it's so vindicating for people who said there were problems with this vaccine and were, were talked down to and criticized and actually marginalized um, in so many different ways.